Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this special uh, LLM and AI event from uh, Progress Mark Logic and, uh, and our partner DataVid. Uh, unlocking the power of your enterprise data uh, with generative AI, uh, leveraging trustworthy AI models. Today, we're going to be joined by uh, Imran Chowdhury, who's our Chief Architect for Healthcare and Life Sciences here at Progress for Mark Logic. Um, as well as Sylvia Triller, the co-founder and uh, full stack developer for DataVit. AI has issues. We're, we are well aware of the, the issues that um, AI have. Um, one, one key one is uh, hallucinations. Um, they are essentially randomly generating text that that makes sense to them, but we know doesn't exist. It's a complete hallucination. Um, there's a good example of this. There was a filing in a case in a Colombian um, case where uh, they cited six cases, cases to prove their case that didn't exist. Um, the lawyer working on the case revealed that he used ChatGTP um, and the tool assured him that they were real. He was unaware that it's not like a search engine, but it's a, a generative language processing tool. Um, so these random hallucinations can and do happen, um, which presents challenges for adoption uh, in the enterprise space. But there are key benefits to um, AI and to adopting AI within your business. Um, and already we're seeing that in the enterprise space, even with these challenges. So, you know, 73% of companies are prioritizing AI above any other digital investment. Um, and they're, they have immediate focus on improving the operational resilience um, in this unprecedented environment. 55% of, uh, of organizations that have deployed AI are actually taking an AI first uh, stance when it comes to new use cases. They are looking to AI to address new systems and new applications that they're building. So with that, we understand that there are challenges and we understand that there is potential benefits to the business. Um, now Imran is going to talk you through how to. Um, sorry, one minute, two seconds. Now Imran is Imran is going to talk you through how Mark Logic and Semaphore, the powerful combination um, of uh, semantics and a knowledge graph, can actually help you leverage your AI to become more trustworthy, to give you uh, better results. Uh, and to uh, potentially make cost savings to your business by using uh, Mark Logic and Semaphore in combination with each other. So Imran, I'll hand it over to you. Yep, so so uh, a little while back when I first started looking at uh, generative AI, uh, Kathy Wood uh, is, is someone I, I listened to. Um, she had a quote that made a lot of sense to me, which was, uh, the winners of AI will be those people who know how to use AI and have private data. Um, and so that uh, started us on a journey of looking at how to use AI with private data in a very effective and uh, trustworthy manner. So um, we just talked about who will win, a uh, little bit of an overview of what generative AI systems are, uh, some major concerns that Phil just touched on, um, how how to go about improving accuracy and how to merge your generative AI data with your enterprise data. Uh, and then um, we'll go through an example uh, and, and show you some uh, results from the example and the testing that we did based on the example architectures that we came, came uh, uh, created. Uh, we have our obligatory, obligatory disclaimer. Um, we're going to be talking about third-party tools uh, and, and are not responsible for the behavior and operation of those tools. So generative AI is an algorithm that can be used to generate text, audio, images uh, very, very rapidly. Um, common descriptions are AI, Gen AI, LLM, which stands for Large Language Model. 
Uh, I like Golems, which is uh, a, a, um, sort of large language, multimodal models, right? Um, so there's a, a lot of different ways these things are referred to. Another really simple way of referring to them is a text predictor, and this is really uh, what they're doing under the hood, uh, at least for the uh, textual um, um, modality. Um, again, uh, for text, you can do a lot of different things. You can do text summarization. You can uh, 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 create support emails and chat. You can generate new content. You can translate content, things like that. Um, uh, also, coding is becoming very uh, an interesting application of this, where people can use it to define a high-level objective and generate sort of raw code, and then um, bug fix code and so on. Uh, images, videos, and 3D and other uh, things are also uh, coming on the market um, and uh, are, are now available in, in different generative AI systems. Um, you know, one, one system I found particularly interesting uh, from a modality perspective is fMRI. Uh, basically, uh, a study in Japan was looking at blood flow in the brain and using that to recreate images that people were seeing. Um, so sort of, uh, uh, sort of the beginnings of, of telepathy, so to speak. All right. Uh, again, we talked about hallucinations uh, about 15 to 20 percent of the time. Uh, things go wrong um, with, with the generative AI systems. Uh, in fact, the second question I asked in, in, my, uh, in the start of my testing journey uh, was a completely wrong answer. Uh, data biases will lead to biases in the answers. Uh, that seems fairly obvious, but uh, understanding what your data is, how representative it is of the real, real world, uh, is becoming more and more important as these systems are making more and more critical decisions uh, uh, for your business uh, or even within society. Um, sometimes reasoning uh, gets in, uh, ha has issues. The Gen AI has issues with reasoning and sort of making logical conclusions. Uh, these systems take a long time to train, so typically data cutoffs are in the one and a half year to two year range. Uh, also, um, it's really hard for uh, uh, people to understand exactly what the reasoning was and, and, and how well it can be explained. Finally, uh, even though these systems are being built to uh, be safe and helpful and harmless, um, uh, you can uh, inject uh, bad prompts into these systems and get them to uh, start doing things that they are not intended to do. So robustness is also an issue with these systems. Uh, you can take these large language models that are generated by OpenAI and Google, for example, and uh, start fine-tuning them with your own enterprise data. There are issues with doing this. It is uh, pretty expensive. It's also not being offered broadly. Um, only certain select customers are, are being granted the opportunity to do it right now. You could also take open source models and create uh, and fine tune those or uh, generate an open source model from scratch. It requires a lot of technical expertise. It's a, it's a very expensive proposition as well. Um, uh, and uh, um, this is kind of like adding uh, information into the long-term memory, like the really long-term memory of, 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 a, of a person, right? So uh, we, we took a quick look at ChatGPT first because that was the most popular system on the market uh, and still is, I believe, at the current time. And uh, but but uh, it is it is just an example. Um, your particular use cases may or may not uh, be applicable to to ChatGPT, and so you know please look at your use cases and security needs very carefully before proceeding with any of these uh, Gen AI systems. So up until recently, um, ChatGPT was logging all of the interactions and was using that to further improve the model, uh, which was a security concern for many enterprises. ChatGPT now has the option to exclude 
uh, data from from being logged uh, as of uh, April 2023. It isn't. Uh, explicit decision and you have to opt into it, uh, but you can do it. Um, and chat GPT's conversational history is kind of like short-term memory in humans. Uh, the first version of chat GPT supported 4K tokens, newer versions uh, support up to 32K tokens. So, so we'll talk a little bit about this in more detail because that is pretty relevant to the architecture and solutions we have been working on and coming up with. So as I said, ChatGPT, the largest one is now up to 32K tokens. Anthropic is an interesting uh, one that uh, is now up to 100K tokens. Um, think of the tokens as uh, the sort of short-term memory um, of, of a conversation that the Gen AI can hold into its RAM for its predictions of what to say next. Uh, and Here's an example of a token. This is straight off of OpenAI's website. Um, I basically put in this uh, paragraph or string <clears throat> into the OpenAI um, uh, page here. And uh, all of the colors are tokens. So a word can be made up of two or maybe three, uh, maybe even sometimes four tokens. Uh, sometimes smaller words or even larger words end up being a single token. So a token translates into roughly 75 words. Uh, 100 tokens translates roughly into 75 words um, at a time. If we look at the word the in, in the string, it shows up three times. When we click on the token IDs, uh, we get the number 262 three times in the right space and in the right order where the word the showed up in the words. So um, the and the number 262 are synonymous in this particular model's token representation. It's very important to note that these tokens are tied directly to a single version of a single model. Um, and and the, the tokens um, uh, do change when you change out uh, the kind of version of the model that you're you're using. Uh, so companies should also validate their privacy and security options uh, for their own specific use cases, um, and and uh, you know understand that certain SaaS environments are more secure or less secure than others, and should check out the the agreements and and those things uh, very carefully. So the problem statement we came up with is, okay, uh, the fine tuning or building your own AI from scratch is an expensive, hard proposition, has problems with uh, security and IP leakage as well. And um, so how can we affect the answer uh, of these Gen AI systems when we can't really change the long-term memory? Or in other words, how can we train or influence the model with enterprise data? And, and that's where this short-term memory comes into play. Uh, uh, and um, we'll talk a little bit about that after we give you a quick overview of what MarkLogic does. So MarkLogic is a unified data platform uh, consisting of two major products. Uh, one is MarkLogic, which is a multi-model uh, data place. It's a really good place to store enriched data uh, you can look at the data as rows and columns, as documents, as key value pairs, as geospatial information. You can do full search on it. Um, uh, and with graph capabilities, you can do full semantic search on it. Um, so there's a lot of uh, really good ways of retrieving and understanding what's in the in the MarkLogic system. Um, because of the flexibility in which we store the data, you can pull the data from pretty much any data type. You can pull it from any application. Uh, it fits into many enterprise architectures architectures and works in many workflows and orchestration systems, including all the major cloud vendors. So, so getting the data in, uh, being able to model and have and remodel that data with data agility is a really easy way of, of implementing sort of content in Mark Logic. Semaphore is really good at mo modeling knowledge graphs at capturing subject matter expertise and storing it in a knowledge graph, at being able to publish those knowledge graphs so that they can be reused at scale across hundreds of machines. Um, once you have these knowledge graphs version controlled, stored, uh, crowdsourced, edited, 
then you can use those knowledge graphs to do classification of content and fact extraction of content as well. And those capabilities are built into the Semaphore product. Um, so, so once you combine MarkLogic and Semaphore together, you end up with semantic search capabilities. And uh, really what we're going to focus on today is search, clustering, similarity search, and, and operating our, our system as a Gen AI independent memory system. Uh, so, so what does that look like? Uh, basically, you can, um, uh, the Gen AI can ask questions of MarkLogic, uh, and MarkLogic can do a semantic search based on sort of the question that's being asked, or the user can ask a question of the Gen AI system, and, and that's really what we're trying to figure out. What is the best content to give the Gen AI system so that the Gen AI can, can give you good, trustworthy, responsible answers? Um, there's also a, a lot of interesting cost savings that, that come about from this long-term memory architecture, and we'll talk about it uh, in, uh, going forward. So uh, simply put, the out-of-the-box architecture that people started test driving uh, you know, when, when uh, ChatGPT was published was really uh, that, uh, okay, the user asks a question and the Gen AI then goes ahead and uh, responds to it. And, um, uh, you know, all of the problems that we talked about are still part of the, the issue that, 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 that happened. And this is very much like a closed book exam. You know, you spend a year and a half teaching the Gen AI what to do, and then the system goes ahead and uh, tries to answer the best it can from, from whatever it learned. It may or may not have the correct data, and hence it may even hallucinate because it doesn't have the right context and so on. With uh, um, uh, enterprise data in the mix, uh, this is very much like an open book exam with the ability to get to the right page. And what you have going on here is you bring in the content into MarkLogic, you put the content into sections that are small enough to fit into the token window that we talked about. Um, when a question is, is formed or a task is formed by the user, that uh, the 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 high relevancy words in that question can be used to return the best matching results some, uh, in the MarkLogic search results. Those then sections of documents can be fed to the Gen AI system along with the, uh, the question itself. And now the Gen AI has more context and can answer questions a little bit better. Um, there are still problems with the answers, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how to make this better in the next slide. And and sort of the next architectural example is the same architecture that we had, but now we're adding semantics into the mix. And semantics affects pretty much the whole process that we just talked about as well. Uh, the first step of the process is, is just bring the content in, chop it up into sections, but then you can you, you use the semantics to capture the subject matter expertise of your enterprise uh, subject matter experts, uh, and and you can then use that graph to tag the documents, to classify those documents, to fact extract content from those documents. So now you're getting a much more semantically enriched content. Then when the user asks a query or, or, or requests a task of the Gen AI, you take the same sort of string and you run it through the content graph as well, and you start understanding the semantics of what the user is trying to ask, and then prioritizing the semantically rich content as part of the search. So now you're doing a semantic search. Uh, essentially, if you had the same, you know, let's say one billion documents in MarkLogic, in the previous case, you would, and you had a certain search that you wanted to qu uh, query about those documents, you might say, okay, I get, have 100 documents coming back at me. Um, with semantic search, you would get those same 100 documents, but the order in which those documents would be prioritized would be different because we now know a lot more about the subject matter expertise or the user's intent as part of the user's role and, and you know what we're asking the question of. So once you do that, 
then you can uh, go ahead uh, and get the right semantic content. Then the next step of the process that, that we did is we also said, okay, in these top five documents that may fit into the context window of our Gen AI, there's really high value semantic sentences. We can use a semantic graph to further filter the content and really only give the Gen AI the really high value content. Um, and then the Gen AI uh, is also given the question or the task and can answer better. Finally, the answer itself will have semantic content and you can create hot links in the semantic content itself and provide that back to the user so the user can check not only the semantic content graphs, but also where the actual content came from in terms of hot links back to the content and mark logic too. All right, so let's uh, take a look at these three architectures and take a look at how ChatGPT responded uh, with these three architectures. So we, we went through a use case. Uh, the use case was a health insurance company um, with planned benefit coverage. There were hundreds of documents that were part of this uh, synthesized uh, um, uh, coverage plan. Um, users could be members, providers, billers, customer representatives, uh, and and you know they'll be asking questions like, uh, do I have coverage for this condition? Is this condition treated? Do I need pre-authorization? Things that that typically happen uh, in health plans, uh, as as most folks in in the states uh, know that they have to be very careful about how to uh, interpret what what is allowed and not allowed in their health plans. Uh, so, so we start off with a very simple question. Um, you know, what is CGM? And the first row, first column here is the out of the box answer. The second column is the private data mark logic only answer, and the third uh, answer is the architecture with the semantics uh, built into it. And for simpler questions, all three tended to do a decent job at answering the question. So we, we went through a, a, like probably five or six of these kind of questions and all, all of them were doing decently. And so we said, all right, let's start pushing the systems to the limits and start trying to see um, when, when the systems are not able to derive proper context, right? And so uh, one of the more interesting uh, tests that we did is say, okay, list all of the billing codes related to CGM and give us a brief description of the codes. Uh, the out of the box one was, you know, I'm not really sure I know about these billing codes. Shall I try to fetch a few for you? And my answer was yes. And so it went ahead and tried. It got a, got a few of them and said, do you want me to try to find some more? And so this is uh, um, sort of pushing it on the edge. Um, it didn't get it wrong, but it didn't also complete it. Um, with the private document in play that had the relevant content in it, the Gen AI was able to answer the question much more uh, rapidly, as well as just a single shot, just started answering. Um, and then with the semantics, where, where complete sentences were, were sort of part of the, part of the, what was fed into the semantic AI uh, sort of prompt, um, we even got complete sentences back. So, so better formatting, sort of better understanding of what, it was, what we were asking it to do. And then uh, the last question was really hard for the out of the box one to answer, and it actually did a good job answering it, um, which was, uh, does this made up acne insurance company pay for CGM? Um, since it had no information about this made up healthcare acne insurance company, it said, I don't know, please go talk to acne insurance company, which was a decent answer, um, given that it didn't have context. Um, with, the, with the private data available to the same chat GPT Gen AI, right? It was able to say, yeah, Acne Insurance covers CGM and here's the kinds of things to, to look out for. And with the semantic data, it gave an even more detailed answer. And here, what we're saying in, in the third architecture is that because we were returning semantic content, we could uh, highlight and tag and make uh, basically hot links back to the semantic graph so that users can easily inspect what each of these semantic concepts, concepts are and uh, uh, you know be able to understand how they're related to each other. Also in Semaphore, end users can provide feedback. So I could say, you know, um, 
uh, another alternative label for CGM, another synonym for CGM might be continuous glucose monitoring system as opposed to just continuous glucose monitoring, right? So, so I could feed that back as a suggestion in semaphore to the team that manages the semantic graphs. Uh, some key takeaways: if if you are if you don't have enough information or if you're feeding it garbage, you're not going to have good answers out. Um, and so, garbage in, garbage out is still very very relevant in the Gen AI world. Um, hallucinations and problem other problems exist even if the data is good um, because the Gen AI may not have the right context. It might have biased data um, and or logic errors or data cutoffs and things like that. Um, with MarkLogic and Semaphore, you can put very explainable, repeatable guardrails around Gen AI, and you can essentially turn a black box into a transparent white box with reference links and hot links that users can validate and check. Uh, and, and also, you can log all of that information and provide uh, uh, feedback. And, and once you've started logging the, the Q&A, for example, you can start reusing that Q&A as well, and that can shortcut uh, costs as well in, in Gen AI systems. So uh, business benefits are increased accuracy, improved trustworthiness. We just talked about the cost savings. Um, the ability to sort of really understand what is being sent to the Gen AI, what, what is being responded by the Gen AI, what pieces of the content is actually being used by the Gen AI, right? These are all uh, very important. Uh, and um, the other really interesting thing is this is a solid architecture that you can implement today without uh, needing sort of beta software uh, or major changes to the architecture. Um, uh, and it's very much independent of the AI system you use. So, so um, it's not just a one-off. It's you're actually building a system on a platform that can manage your semantic content within your enterprise. Right. Uh, so, so really, the goal of doing this is to get trustworthy answers, and and uh, we've been seeing that across our customer base. All right. Um, talked about most of these. And another really interesting thing is is corporate enterprise data needs to be secured. Uh, it typically is tied to roles. Uh, you can take role-based security and tie that into your your content. And if a user comes in and doesn't have those roles, then they don't get the content and the Gen AI doesn't generate uh, information off of those contents. So you're really tying your security model all the way through to your Gen AI uh, model as well. Uh, and this is just, just uh, sort of another way of looking at security. Uh, and, and Mark Logic has been used in many of the most secure uh, three-letter government agencies in the U.S. as well as around the world. MarkLogic uh, and Semaphore are used in a lot of different verticals. Uh, Gen AI is being used in a lot of different verticals because language is, is sort of how we interact with the world uh, of, of information anyways. Um, and so, so all of these verticals are, are, if, are fair game for, for using our unified data platform with Gen AI systems, right? And some, some use cases across different verticals, uh, drug discovery, medical imaging, and disease diagnostics are, are things that, that, that I'm, I'm intimately familiar with. Uh, in the banking side, fraud, manage, fraud detection, risk management, uh, predictive analytics, credit evaluations, things like that come into play. Um, some of our customers have been doing sort of demand forecasting, but also uh, uh, data analytics. So is this part going to fail? Can I uh, replace it before it fails? Those sorts of things. Um, and then uh, in, in manufacturing, research and development uh, and demand forecasting are some really good examples of, of use cases where Gen AI is being used. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over, turn it back to Phil at this point. All right, thank you very much, Imran. Um, that was really uh, interesting to see. Like I say, we, we know there are challenges with AI, but we believe um, the solution and the work that uh, Imran has uh, come up with um, can address some of those. Uh, so now to show this um, in practice, um, I'm gonna hand over to Sylvia. She's gonna show how 
Uh, we've addressed these issues uh, using the combination of uh, Mark Logic and Semaphore um, with their proprietary technology from uh, DataVid, DataVid Rover. So, Sylvia, uh, it's over to you. Hello. It is nice to be back at the Mark Logic community event. Uh, thank you for having me. I will be referring to lots of the terms you have described throughout my presentation. Uh, back in June, we had the opportunity to present our work, DataVid Rover, built on top of MarkLogic. Today, we'll showcase further development we have done to the platform to include the trending ChatGPT LLMs. Uh, before getting into the actual LLM work, I'll introduce myself, DataVid, and do a quick description of what DataVid Rover is. So, uh, I am Silvia Kirilla, one of the DataVid co-founders. Officially, I am doing technical leadership at any level, but uh, at heart, I am and will always remain uh, a developer with over 10 years of experience using, using MarkLogic. As the name says, we at DataVid, we are eager, uh, avid, to tackle any related, uh, data-related business problem. What does DataVid regularly do? We provide expert consulting services to deliver data projects. We work with proven technologies such as MarkLogic, Apache NiFi, Snowflake, and many, many others to build high value business solutions. Having DataVid started out by a group of technical people, we are trained to see patterns and working with a multitude of enterprise clients allowed us to see an emerging trend in relation to what many data products require. And this is how the rover idea has came up. Similarly to Mars Rover, we have thought of a product which would allow its users to explore their valuable asset, data. Rover contains our accumulated expertise and know-how while attempting to keep up with the technological trends. The pattern we have noticed and the solution we have sketched is illustrated in this slide. We start out from the various structured and mostly unstructured data sources. We proceed to ingest the data then enriching it with the sole purpose of um, exposing the data in a format that will enable user to discover their organizational, and not only, uh, their organizational data via a more cognitive and semantic search. We understand that one size doesn't fit at all, so we have set up Rover to act both as a product, but also as an acceleration pack to allow customization such that the direction of the discovery can be dictated by the needs of the end user. Back in June, we demoed the rover version based on COVID-19 research articles, which have been imported from the medical archive. Also, we have used two ontologies, COVOC and the human disease ontology as semantic base for the enrichment. The main technologies used were MarkLogic, Semaphore, Python, and a few others. Uh, the focus of our, of our demonstration was to show the capabilities for content exp uh, exploration and insights and the powerful synergy between content and semantics by leveraging the enriched content and the formed knowledge graph. Today, based on the same data set, mostly same technology stack with the addition of OpenAI, we will demo a ChatGPT-like experience for the users of Rover with the additional features of allowing the user to navigate to the sources of the answers. Moreover, we restrict the context based on which answers were generated by considering the search that the user is making. How have you done all this? Well, uh, we started from the sample semantic knowledge architecture that Imran presented earlier. In the rover uh, architecture, we already cover semantic enrichment doing gestion via semaphore and using MarkLogic to store and query the data. From this, it has been a quick step to integrate uh, LLMs by using OpenAI for the user query. Namely, uh, we take in the user query, we start by condensing the question, an operation supporting by, supported by OpenAI. The condensed term is a bit misleading in my view, as actually the user's input is many times expanding by deducing the intent of the question. Moreover, at this step, the conversation history is taken into consideration to build more of a standalone question. Then we use the semaphore instance we have configured to do the extraction of terms from the condensed question. However, well, we have noticed a limitation at this point, as not every differentiating term can be contained in an ontology. Hence, we have employed a simple NLP task to extract the noun phrases. 
Then the result of the two extraction is given to MarkLogic to execute a query which would retrieve best matching paragraphs of data together with their provenance, which would be URIs and paragraphs IDs. At this point, we have decided to give even more context by list, uh, listing the synonyms as well. Uh, for example, we have created a paragraph which was uh, stating that COVID-19 is a synonym of SARS-CoV-2. And lastly, we put together the extracted paragraphs, the synonyms, uh, paragraphs as context and pass them to the, uh, con uh, along with the condensed question to OpenAI to generate an answer having controlled and limited information which will remain private, hidden to the world. Okay, and now let's go to demo. To make a full screen to make sure that all of the data can be seen just right. So uh, we have created a chat widget to demonstrate the integration of LLMs into our product. Let me start out the conversation. How to measure a disease lethality. So the lethality of disease can be measured uh, using this type of analysis. Uh, what is interesting to see is that uh, I have posted the exact same question on, uh, on ChatGPT. The answer I, was got, uh, I got was rather generic, but nowhere did I get a mention about this type of uh, analysis tool that we have here. Uh, which easily shows the fact that in order to answer to this kind of question, only private data has been used. Here below, we have a reference which once you click it, it will point you to the source of the data in order to allow the user to cross-validate everything that has been used for the answer. We have highlighted everything such that the user doesn't have to go throughout the, the entire article as it has the potential to be quite long. Let me just clear the history and I am going to post now a very generic question. Tell me about COVID-19. Being a generic question uh, and having as data sources mostly COVID-19 articles, the context that is getting formed can be massive. Hence, it's taking a slightly longer time to get the answer. So here we get COVID-19 is the umbrella term for diverse pathological manifestation and so on. Now I can ask him even further questions. Tell me about COVID-19 variants. And here we see a couple of versions. We have the founder variant, alpha variant, delta and Omicron, but I don't see beta. Let's see if there's a beta version. Is there a yes, there is, as we all kind of already knew. Um, now, uh, what are the differences between alpha and beta? Okay. So we do get quite some information about this. The reason I wanted to show you this kind of scenario is to see that actually you can have a more complex conversation using this tool. And also you can still continue using the references in order to uh, cross validate every kind of information that you get here, especially when you get specific numbers as these ones. So I will go to the first reference. And now, Looking at the source, I see it that the numerical mentions, which can be quite some, quite important when doing research act, uh, activities, are exactly the same ones as mentioned here. Okay, now uh, I will go uh, in a different tab where I have prepared uh, a different query. I have searched for diabetes and I have restricted the query to work only uh, for to, to get me data only in March. Let's look again at the answer we got when I asked it uh, when I asked the the tool about COVID-19. Let's run the same query here. Uh, 
As you might have noticed, uh, we have here a small disclaimer saying that the, the source of data is using the search results that are uh, displayed in the background. Now, you will see that the answer is quite different. It's pointing, still pointing to a, a source location and it gives you the relevant information which was considered to be relevant in March 2022. This capability of using the underlying query actually allows the user to restrict and have focus on what they are looking to get as information. Furthermore, uh, furthermore uh, the user could use authors to filter in case they want to analyze the work of a specific author. Okay, and the last case that I wanted to show you was uh, more of a simple query. What is TB? We get the quick and short answers. Uh, answer. As always, well, we can click on the source reference and navigate to the document. Uh, Similarly to the previous case, here we, will, we use a source depending on, on the view of the user. Here we use it, uh, the, the current document that it is in view. So the next questions that uh, are going to be asked will be in relation, will be answered based on the document that's being seen. Uh, what's the relation between COVID-19 and TB? Obviously, the relation is not a positive one. Anyway, uh, let's assume that uh, the user is scrolling through the document as he deems it relevant for his research. And he somehow gets to, to this area where he finds an acronym which is not explain it, its surrounding. Then the user can ask another very simple question. What is LTBI? So LTBI, it's an acronym, which stands for this concept. So we get we got the acronym explained, and also we can see where this acronym has been defined. This can be quite a productivity tool when you want to analyze a large document and you can ask questions on top of, uh, of it rather than reading and scrolling through all of it. Okay, so the takeaways after implementing this kind of solution using MarkLogic, Semaphore, and OpenAI uh, are the fact that there is no need to employ a vector DB, so you can uh, have a tighter uh, control over the cost. Uh, you control uh, the privacy of the data, namely you can definitely select and limit what kind of data is being sent over to OpenAI. Uh, the ease of integration, uh, and the fast feedback loop. Uh, th this kind of implementation did not took a long time and the feedback loop was extremely fast. The provenance linking for cross-checking against sources and in this way uh, we can give proper assurance to the final users that the responses are not hallucination. And the fact that uh, there are no more data uh, transformation to be done uh, over the data hub or data lake. And obviously, uh, there is an increase in relevancy and accuracy, given the fact that uh, the base data set is the organizational data set, which uh, is assumed to be curated and relevant for the users. The warnings or the not so good part is that uh, the fact that large documents require further processing to ensure proper context selection. Uh, for example, the documents uh, I have used, um, the articles were uh, of various sizes and uh, we had to, to chop them and make sure that all of the paragraphs are relevant. Um, this may, may be a problem when you have such documents as um, the search score, will uh, the default search score might have to be a little bit amended. 
in order to get the, the most relevant paragraphs. Um, also, occasionally the context might, might be deemed insufficient for generating an answer. Uh, in order to, to do that, you may go further into computing more custom scores for paragraphs in order to, to make sure that uh, the OpenAI algorithm has uh, more than enough context to get you the answer. Thank you. Over to you, Philip. Sylvia, thank you very much for that demo. Uh, thank you for showing uh, how MarkLogic and Semaphore, that combination, um, can really provide the, the not only the context, um, but also the trust um, that you can see in that demo. Um, you can trust the answers that you get back uh, because it is pointing very much to the location in the data where uh, you're getting those answers from. So that, that was really good, and uh, and, and thank you, Omar. Well, thank you for joining us today um, for this uh, special on AI and LLMs. Uh, if you'd like to join us uh, in the future, please do check out our community events um, as well as our specials uh, on Bright Talk. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Have a thank good you. one.